Eğer ki. Eğer ki. Hayatımızda hiç eğer olmasaydı nasıl olurdu? Size şöyle söyleyeyim. Her şey daha az parlak, daha az yeşil olurdu. Ve daha az parlak yeşil. Çünkü eğerler ormanların derinliklerinde tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşler. Eğerler Nobel ve Guggenheim'ın aklına takılır. Ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırar. Asla yalnız yürümezler ve aşırı bulaşıcıdırlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler gülü umursamazlar, robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıla dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Good afternoon, dear audience and the presenters. Welcome to the last session of the fifth international conference on new developments in soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. First of all, I would like to thank to the distinguished organizing committee chairs, Professor Feyza Çinicioğlu and Professor Javid Atalar for having me in Near East University as the chairperson of this session. Uh, in this session, We have two videos and the re remaining will be presented by the authors. Um, I request the authors to make uh, their presentations in 10 minutes sharp uh, because just after this session we will have the closing ceremony. Uh, and I would like to invite the uh, author of the first paper, uh, Efe Aslan, uh, and the title of the presentation is Evaluation of relationship between strength properties of rock samples and drilling rate index. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, my name is Efe Aslan. Uh, first of all, let me share my screen. I hope you can see my screen right now. Uh, I am PhD candidate from Istanbul Technical University and also working as a geotechnical engineering, a geotechnical engineer at Zemine Tutan Tasarım AŞ. Today I'm going to talk about the evolution of relationships between strength properties of rock samples and drilling rate index, uh, which is a case study. Uh, my content is going to uh, give you a brief introduction. Then I will talk about the institute applications which were conducted in the site location. Afterwards, I'm going to give a brief information related to experimental studies. And I'm going to conclude my presentation by uh, summing up the evaluations and the conclusions of this experimental research. Uh, An accurate estimation of drillability became a mandatory factor in planning design and construction stages of underground projects for the excavation phases, for example, in mining, tunneling, or uh, the other underground constructions. The drilling process, cutter wear, and related costs are becoming compulsive elements. Uh, therefore, in parallel with the accurate estimations, rock cutting tools and equipment may be optimized and drilling rate may provide beneficial data for underground excavations, such as using TBM uh, or other excavators. Uh, 
the selection of these tools without physical, mechanical or mineralogical properties, information of the plant construction area can cause major problems for all stages of project. Uh, to begin with, sorry, the comprehensive subsurface investigation program was conducted to delineate the soil rock and groundwater conditions in the subject area of the project site located in the Gulf region. You can see the map down below the page, uh, which consisted mainly land-based geotechnical drilling process. Uh, the project site is located in the Qatar region. Uh, the wireline rotary drilling method has been employed uh, by using PQ3 type core barrel equipment to generate high quality core samples with better core recovery. The boreholes were drilled vertically by rotary wash boring methods producing core samples with nominal diameter of 82 millimeters and continuous coring was performed as per the BS uh, standard. Core samples retrieved through each run and photographed first to show the in-situ position and orientation of course without disturbance and then locked by the geology engineers. The rock parameters were measured in situ also as well. The samples were wrapped with the plastic stretch to preserve its own natural water content and placed in proper core boxes for delivery purposes to the different laboratories. Uh, appropriate sample selections were made for the laboratory tests. Uh, you can see the in situ application summation the range of approximate observable thickness formations encountered in boreholes. The greater part of the land consists of uniform limestone, horizon of Middle Eocene age, the Simsima limestone, varies from 26 to 38 meters. The Simsima limestone is underlined by the Midra shale. Uh, it is varies also from two meters to six meters. Beneath that, there's a rust formation and a rust formation with gypsum content. On the top of these formations, the solid geology is overlaid by shallow cover of loose to medium dense, silty, gravel sand and the quaternary caprock formations. Uh, for the experimental studies after the institute applications, in the scope of this experimental research, rock samples which were collected from the different formations were examined. Uh, the drillability tests, unixile compressive strength test, and the shimitami rebound hardness test were conducted to evaluate the relationships between the strength properties and the drilling rate index of these rock samples. Uh, first of all, the unixile compressive strength test were performed on 157 rock core samples, which had a diameter of 82 millimeters and length to diameter H over D ratio is uh, varies between. 2 to 2.5. The stress raise rate was applied within the limits of 0.5 to 1 megapascal per second in accordance with the ASTM standards. Uh, you can see the results in the graph. Uh, some of the boreholes are up to 80 meters. Some of the varies uh, from 40 to 60 meters. But uh, I can sum up that the Simsima limestone formation has got the greater Unixile uh, compressive strength values rather than the other formations. In the general tendency, shows the uh, relation between them. The next one, the next experimental test is the compressive strength and elastic moduli of intact rock car test. These tests were performed on 115 samples. The modulus of elasticity was determined as the average value of tangent modulus of elasticity and the second modulus of elasticity. The Poisson's ratio determined as the ratio of the modulus of elasticity and the slope of the diametric curve. Uh, you can see the results of the experimental uh, result. It is also shown that uh, similar to the without the modulus test, uh, the Simsima limestone formation has got the greater values in the compressive strength manner, uh, elasticity results and uh, the Poisson ratio results. The Shimitami rebound test performed on 95 rock specimen. Uh, the L-type Shimitami having impact energy of 0 0.74 uh, Newton meter was used in accordance with the ISRM standard. The orientation of the hammer 
was on vertical downward position and 20 impacts were conducted and separated by at least a diameter of the plunger. The lower 50% of the rebound values were eliminated and the average value was recorded as the Shimitami rebound hardness number. Uh, in accordance with the previous test, the Simsima limestone formation has got the greater uh, mean value. Uh, to catch up with the reliability test, uh, these tests, uh, the NTNU SIMTEF reliability test method was developed at the Department of Geolo Ge Geology and the Mineral Resources Engineering at Norwegian Technic and Scientific University. The drilling rate index, DRI, is assessed on the basis of two laboratory tests. The first one is the brittleness value, a sub-20 test, and the Sievers J value, miniature drill test. Uh, to assess the drilling rate in this, we need to use this chart, which is shown in the page right now. Uh, by using brittleness value and the C versus J value, we can use these uh, curves to obtain the drilling rate index. To begin with, uh, we need to identify the C versus J value by conducting the miniature drill test. It was developed by Sievers in the 1950s for estimating the cutter life and uh, J value is determined by using the rock sample drilled for a minute with 200 revolutions per minute of the 8.5 millimeter miniature drill bit under two kilogram of static load. Drill hole height was measured uh, as J value is determined as the mean value of the measured drill hole depth in one over 10 millimeter of four to eight repetitive drill holes. You can see on the left corner the schematic representation of this equipment. On the right hand side, you can see the classification of rock surface hardness or resistance to inundation uh, values. Uh, the second test we need to conduct to op obtain the drilling rate index is the brittleness test. It was also developed in Sweden for evaluation of the quality of aggregates. The S sub 20 values show the resistance of a rock specimen to mechanical impacts. A rock sample was crushed in a jaw crusher and sieved through the 16 millimeter and 11.2 millimeter sieves. A hammer of 14 kilogram was dropped on the mortar containing rock material for 20 times. This procedure, procedure was repeated for three to five times for each sample. Material was sieved through an 11.2 millimeter sieve. The percentage of material passing the sieve was determined as the S sub 20 value. Again, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, schematic representation of the test. On the right-hand side, you can see the classification of the rock brittleness values. Uh, to assess the drilling rate index, we need to use these values to obtain the DRR value. The classification of the drilling rate index is given in the left-hand side. Uh, when the DRR value is smaller, the classification is extremely low to medium when it is getting higher uh, from the 58 value, uh, which is classified as the high, very high or extremely high values. Uh, these are the test results that we have conducted for 20 different soil uh, rock samples from different boreholes. Uh, the Simsima limestone formation, which is starting the first one until the eighth one, has got the high and medium classifications. The Ras formation has got extremely high classification. The midra shale is also high and the gypsum rust formation varies from the high to extremely high uh, classification system. Uh, for the evaluations, the relation between the strength properties and the drilling rate index, the closest unexile compressive test and the Schmidt-Hammer rebound hardness test results were selected within a range of minus or plus two meter distance from the drilling rate index test samples. Uh, according to this methodology, the UCS results range from 5.8 to 55.9 megapascal. Modulus of elasticity range from 12,000 to 40,000 megapascal. Poisson ratio range from 0 0.197 to 0 0.335. Uh, schmidt hammer rebound hardness mean value range from 13 to 58. The drilling rate index values of these test rock samples classified from the medium to extremely high. Uh, these values of rust formation samples were classified as extremely high. Gypsum samples classified between high to extremely high. And finally, dolomitic limestone samples classified as medium to high. 
these are the correlations between the unexile compressive strength and uh, Schmidt-Hammer rebound to the reading rate index. Uh, as we observed that with the increasing DRI value, uh, the unexile compressive strength values are getting smaller as we ex expected. And also again, the uh, surface tension, which is uh, determined by the Schmidt-Hammer test, uh, the, with the increasing value of the drilling rate index, the Schmidt-Hammer mean values are getting smaller. And the relations between the elasticity modulus and the Poisson ratio are given in the page. Uh, again, with the uh, unexile compressive strength values, it is getting smaller and the drilling rate index getting higher. Uh, same tendency, same behavior shown in the modulus of elasticity. On the other hand, as we expected, with the increasing uh, value of the Poisson ratio, the drilling rate index increases also. To sum up the experimental research, the correlations between the drilling rate index and the strength properties of rocks were investigated. Rock samples collected from different geotechnical formations and strength properties of all samples were determined by laboratory experiments. The drilling rate index decreases with increasing UCS, schmidt hammer rebound hardness mean value, and the modulus of elasticity. Uh, drilling rate index increases with increasing Poisson ratio. Uh, further studies could investigate the mineralogical properties of rock samples to assess the influence on their drilling rate index. And also estimation of this drilling rate index could be associated with the institute test by executing diagraphy drilling. Uh, these experimental results could be supported with field data where drilling speed meter per hour could be correlated with the varying geotechnical formations. Uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for your listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Mr. Aslan. Uh, we will take the questions of the audience at the end of this session. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite uh, the next presenter, uh, Jose Concheridel. And uh, the uh, title of his presentation is Unsaturated Geomechanical and Physicochemical Characterization of Soils used for adobe blocks but Please. just before that i would like to call all the presenters that we will have a screenshot uh, so please do not leave the session so please go ahead please go. Uh, thank you very much uh, i don't know if you can see my screen i think you do now right yeah so good afternoon as was said, my name is Jose Concha, and today I will present my research on Adobe Blocks. The topics that I will present today are a short background and the problem that I observe related to Adobe's. Alongside this, the research questions and objectives. After that, we will go through the methodology and results, and finally finalize with a discussion on those results and the most relevant conclusions that were withdrawn. First and foremost, what are adobe blocks? Adobe blocks are bricks made from a mixture of soil, water, and fiber, which is then dried at the sun. Thanks to its widely available constitutive materials, it has been spread globally. In particular, Chile has most of its vernacular construction made from adobe and other earthen techniques. However, adobe has several issues regarding its engineering properties. For example, there is a wide variation in the reported reported constitutive properties like particle size distribution or uh, plastic limits. In the plot, Duarte showed that several uh, particle size distribution from earth blocks uh, from houses built in Angola. As you can see, the spread is huge, having soils ranging from sands to clays. A second problem is that most of the re research has been conducted from the construction material framework, disregarding the knowledge of soil mechanics. Finally, there is a lot of uncertainty in the reported mechanical properties. For example, the unconfined compressive strength. From the later, uh, two research questions were asked. How do adobe blocks gain their cohesive strength? And can the classic unsaturated 
uh, soil mechanics explain the stress strain behavior of adobe blocks with that in mind the objective of this research is to understand the mechanics uh, that grant adobe blocks their mechanical strength from a geotechnical perspective under the partial saturated framework the soil samples for this study were obtained from the central region of chile at a riverbank used with agricultural purposes the soil has been used in the area for housing and the majority of the vernacular construction. On a first inspection, the soil showed a brown color with a different size particle ranging from sands to silts and a distinctive organic smell. A low amount of vegetable fibers like roots were also found in the soil. Two types of tests have been performed, performed up to this stage, characterization and unsaturated test. For the characterization test, the particle size distribution, the plasticity index, organic content, SEM with EDS, and the specific gravity of the soil was done. For the unsaturated test, the soil water characteristic curve and unsaturated shear box test were performed. For the particle size distribution, two methods were, two methods were used, wet and dry sieving. The washed curve showed a 50% content of fines and a well-graded sand, whereas the dry seed resolved in a poorly graded sand. The dry seed method did not represent the intrinsic properties of the soil as we will see later on. However, the results, um, this result is useful for understanding the soil's uh, particle size distribution when it's dry, as clusters of particles may bind together to create larger arrangements. If compared to other South American researches on earthen materials, the soil seems quite different with a high, higher number of fines. For the plasticity, the soil fell into the category of a low plasticity silt or our, our organic soil. There was no indication of clay from the plasticity chart, plasticity chart as the soil is below the A line. Two other tests were conducted for plasticity using oven dry and washed soil. Both of these tests resulted in lower plasticities. For the organic content, a thermogravimetric analysis was used. This test was performed on the soil sample, the fines obtained through sieving, and on an adobe block sample. Typically, the range at which organic particles are burned is between 100 and 600 degrees. With this, we obtained that the soil has a 6.7% of organic matter, the fine particles a 4.4, and the adobe blocks a 7.3. The increase of the organic matter in the adobe blocks could be related to the inclusion of fibers. However, further research must be conducted to address this point. The SEM images are shown in the top right picture. Maybe these ones. It can be seen that the coarse grains are covered with small clusters of particles. These are the coarse grains. Those clusters have both angular silts and web-shaped particles. If we take a look on the microscopics from smectites, smectites, for example, these ones, <coughs> it can be seen that there is not too much resemblance with the studied soil, whereas there is a much more resemblance with an organic peat soil reported by Casemian. For the EDS analysis, the complete sample showed approximately half of its components made from silica, which is consistent with a sand. The fine particles obtained through sieving showed more than 60% of carbon, which could be attributed to the organic content. The soil water characteristic curve was obtained using the filter paper technique. A special emphasis was put on the drier part of the curve, as adobe blocks have low moisture contents. The filter paper was calibrated using different concentrations of sodium chloride solutions, and the results showed a curve different to the one proposed by the is ASTM standard. From the curve, it can be seen that the soil has a high air entry value and that its shape resembles the shape of a silt. This corroborates that the soil is not a sand, as sands do not have such high air entry values. For the shear box test, the soil was prepared with a known initial moisture content. The sample was then molded into the shear box mold using a specific amount of soil to achieve an initial voids ratio of 1.28. Different saturation degrees were tested to assess the effect of saturation on the shear strength. All samples were manually compacted and put into the shear box test immediately. After the samples were continuously sheared until failure, 
a moisture content sample was retrieved from the failure pane to compare the initial and final moisture contents. These values ranged between 0.5 and 2.5%. For this test, three normal test, uh, stresses were used, 40, 177, and 354 kPa, which are common service conditions for Adobe walls. The shear box test results can be seen in the following plots. In the bottom left plot, the peak and a 20% shear strain shear strength is plotted versus, versus the suction estimated for uh, from the soil water characteristic curve. It can be seen that all, for all normal stresses, shear strength increases with the estimated suction. Points plotted in gray are samples that had higher initial void ratio than 1.28. On the bottom right plot, peak shear strength is plotted versus estimated suction in a linear scale which shows that the relationship between the two variables is nonlinear. Finally, the top right, corn, uh, top right uh, figure shows an example of shear strength versus shear strength and relative horizontal displacement, as well as the volumetric strain. All samples show a contractive behavior regardless of their saturation or suction. However, the driest sample had lower volumetric strains than the wetter ones. One of the most relevant discoveries of the characterization of the soil is its type. In general, researchers have shown that earth materials have clay minerals present in the soil, but these studies show it that, the, uh, that for the studied sample, the soil is mostly sand with silt. The presence of organic content is also relevant as it could be responsible of the microstructure behavior of the, so of the soil, that is the air entry value. With regards to the shear box test, it was discovered that the soil has higher strength as it goes to a drier state. However, the achievement for the initial conditions of the sample is quite difficult and can tamper the results. For example, the points that were plotted in gray. This apparatus also does not provide accurate measurements of the volume changes. And because if it is open, the moisture content of the sample can change, which makes it impossible to know the moisture content of the sample during the test. In conclusion, the washed soil represents better the intrinsic um, particle size distribution of the soil while the dry soil represent uh, the dry soil particle size distribution represents better the in situ conditions the soil has a significant amount of organic matter which are clearer in the microscopic images the soil water characteristic curve has a similar shape as a silty clay soil rather than a sand this indicates that the hydraulic properties of the soil are closer to the washed curve obtained from the particle size distribution and finally, the shear strength increased with the decrease of moisture content, especially at, lowest, at low ranges of saturation. This is associated with the absorption and micropores of the soil. For the future, it is planned to perform constant water content triaxial test, suction control odometer and triaxial test, and also to add fiber to the mixture. I would like to thank the uh, Chilean National Agency for Research and Development and also the people in the acknowledgements uh, section. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, it was uh, lovely to hear. And uh, next, I think we will have a video uh, sent to by but the presenters, maybe. Maybe before that. Yeah, maybe. We can take a picture. Yeah. Uh, okay. Everybody's taken a front page. Yeah. And so we're we going to take a, a session picture. Yeah. Okay. It's an, it's an yeah. it's an, okay. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Aslan, could you turn on your camera, please? Mr. F. Aslan. F. Aslan. Uh, who is there? Who is the? No, who? Who? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. V, can you make your uh, face go up a bit? Your face go up a bit so you can. Ah, you can come ah, closer. That's better. Okay. Good, good. Okay. Okay. Ee, teknik servis alıyor musun? Ee, fotoğraf alındı mı?
alınır. Evet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now only the presenter is going to stay. All others are going backstage. At the end, we are going to take you front page as well. Okay, so we have a video right now. As okay. a presentation, we have a video right now as a presentation, and it's submitted by Ahmed Al Suhali. The title of the video is "The Reduction of Dynamic Traffic Loads Transmitted to the Soil Subgrade Strengthened with Geocell Reinforcement." Evet, şimdi so it's going to be about the reduction of the cyclic loads transmitted to the soil subgrades thanks with the geocell reinforcement. This is Ahmed El Suhaili speaking to you. Introduction. Harmonic and periodic vibration can be generated mostly by heavy machines, moving vehicles, or by running trains, which cause the supporting foundation to behave in a different fashion. Therefore, to mitigate the stresses caused by the dynamic traffic loads, it is proposed to design a shallow reinforcement system using geocells. Geocells consist of a series uh, of interconnected cells that are manufactured from a different type of polymers. The geocells are expanded at, at the construction site and filled with soil. The cell walls completely encased uh, the infill material and provide all around confinement to the soil. During vertical loading, hoof stresses within the cell walls uh, and earth resistance in adjacent cells are mobilized, which increase the stiffness and the load deformation behavior of the soil. Thus, the soil geocells layer acts as a stiff mat and distribute the vertical loads over a much larger area in the soil. In recent time, due to its economy, ace of construction and performance, reinforced soil has been widely used in geotechnical engineering applications, such as construction of roads, railway embankments, retaining wall, stabilization of the slope, and improvement of the soft ground. Nevertheless, few studies into the behavior of the geocell reinforced foundation uh, subjected to dynamic load appear to have been undertaken and these concentrate on the planar reinforced foundation in contrast to peer research an attempt was made to protect the genuine shape of the traffic load by considering the actual simulation of its impact to replicate the real-world scenario of a dynamic traffic load. A, a constructed apparatus is employed with a various load amplitudes and frequency. Material used. A dry sandy soil was used in the present study investigation. Its properties were determined according to the ASTM standard and it was classified according to the unified soil classification system to be poorly graded sand. Uh, we can see in this table the properties of the soil uh, for different type of tests. Reinforcement. A geocell reinforcement was used for this study which was fabricated locally from a planar uh, polymetric tape to form a honeycomb arrangement. The height of the geocell wall was 25 mm and the pocket size of the geocell is taken as the diameter of the uh, of an equivalent circular area uh, of the pocket opening AG, which is shown in figure one. The pocket size of the geocell was kept constant as 70 millimeter, and the ratio of the geocell pocket size to the uh, width of the foundation uh, was equal to 0.7. This ratio is taken uh, based on the uh, research proposed by Dash, which conclude that the ratio, this ratio, give the maximum performance of the improvement. This figure here, uh, showing the uh, polymer tape and the final shape of the geocells. That acquisition system and the test devices. In this figure, we can see the setup for this uh, study. Uh, here we can see the frame 
and the hydraulic jack and the control system with the data logger. Model preparation and testing program. A pre-calculated weight of the sand was poured inside the tank with a different layer. Each layer thickness was 100 mm and each layer was compacted to achieve the required relative density. Uh, in this research, we have performed two uh, set of uh, tests. The first set was performed using a 30% relative density as a loose sand and this, the second set uh, where like, the relative density was taken to be 60% as a median uh, sand. After we reached to the required depth by pouring and compaction of the sand, the uh, PVC buried pipe was placed, overlaid by the uh, thin layer of the sand, and then the pressure cell were, uh, was installed, uh, followed by another uh, layer of sand. Then we will reach to the preparation of or and installation of the geocells which was installed at a depth of 0.1b and then the final layer was placed and developed. Dash has reported that the optimum depth of the geocell reinforcements is to be placed at, at the depth of 0.1b. Uh, from the surface. So uh, as we can see here after we reach to this level the installation of the buried pipe followed by the uh, installation of the pressure cell then the uh, sand layer here followed by the installation of the geocells at the depth of 0.1b and then at a very thin layer of the sand uh, which is followed by the placement of the footing and performed the testing. A series of 48 model uh, were conducted in this uh, study using a different uh, loads, amplitude, and the frequencies. Also, uh, these tests were performed uh, with and without the uh, GSL for the sake of comparison. Results and discussion. Load amplitude. Two different loading amplitude were used in this test, uh, in this research, 0 0.5 and 1 ton. Uh, Figure 7 to 10 show the relationship between the vertical pressure transmitted to the soil uh, with time. In, uh, for the comparison sake of the comparison, we can see that like if we are using loose soil, 30% relative density and 0 0.5 uh, ton amplitude, the reduction of the uh, transmitted pressure reached to 48% if we use the uh, reinforcement, geocell reinforcement, and this uh, this this value decreases to 35% if we are using one ton. However, if we are using medium sand, which have the relative density of 60%, uh, the this uh, this decrease in the this reduction in the pressure transmission will reach to 30% if we are using 0 0.5 ton. However, if we are using one ton, the improvement or the reduction of the uh, pressure transmission reached to 25%. You can see here in figure 7 the, the uh, variation of the vertical pressure above the pipe with amplitude of loading of 0 0.5 ton and uh, frequency of 0 0.5 hertz and if the relative density to be 30%. The blue uh, graph represent the soil without reinforcement, the red graph represent the soil with reinforcement. Uh, on the right hand we can see the variation of the uh, same test but with a, a higher amplitude of loading is which is equal to one ton. In figure 9 we can see that the uh, the response of the soil within the also the 0.5 ton loading amplitude the frequency 0 0.5 hertz but here the relative density is higher which is equal to 60 percent. Uh, again on on figure 10 we can see the same response but with a different uh, amplitude of loading, which is equal to one ton. Figure 11 to uh, 14 demonstrate the same set uh, with a different uh, frequencies between uh, 0 0.5 and 2 hertz. We can see that if we increase the, the hertz to 2 hertz, the vertical pressure increased by 43%. Uh, 
also the uh, the maximum reading of the dynamic stresses was collected in the graph presented in figure 15. Here again, the same uh, amplitude of the of the uh, loading and different frequencies, same relative density. And here we can see that the relationship between the load frequency and the vertical uh, pressure transmitted to the soil subgrade with a different amplitude and relative densities. Conclusion. Experimental studies have been conducted to explore the possibilities of using geocells in protecting underground utilities and buried pipelines. The following conclusion can be drawn. Comparison between the pressure result with and without the geocell reinforcement in loose and medium sand showed that the pressure transmitted to the soil subgrade decreases by 25 to 40%. And these percentages are different according to the state of the loading and the test conditions. When the relative density of the sand decreases, uh, increases from 30 to 60%, the vertical pressure decreases by 30%. In general, uh, reinforcing the sandy soils with geocells lead to beneficial reduction in dynamic response for the all state of the soil in different percentages, accompanied by the uh, increment of the soil strength. These are the references, and thank you for listening. Uh, I thank uh, Mr. Ahmed Asuhali for his uh, video uh, contribution to our conference. And we are moving on to the next presentation. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Evaluation of Stone Column and Jet Grouting. Uh, it is prepared by Abatko and Güler. Uh, I invite Professor Güler to make the presentation. Uh, we can't hear you. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Eskishar. Uh, it's my pleasure to make this presentation. So uh, do I press share? Maybe. Uh, presentation. Yeah, I think it's here. Okay. Uh, okay, so first a brief introduction. Uh, there are uh, two commonly used uh, soil improvement techniques, uh, which uh, are jet grout columns and vibrostone columns. Uh, the technique of jet grouting, just to remind, uses a high pressure and high velocity jet fluid to mix the in-situ soil with cement slurry to form a soilcrete column. And stone column method refers to columns of compacted gravel-sized stone particles established in the ground. Uh, both jet grout and stone columns are used to increase the bearing capacity and to reduce unspated uh, static settlements. However, uh, the subject that we will uh, try to deal with in this case uh, was a project where uh, also liquefaction risk uh, exists. And although the literature cites that jet grout columns also mitigate liquefaction risk, the engineer wanted to verify this uh, by uh, conducting a site uh, experimental field. Uh, the soil encountered at the site uh, is uh, for the works of Ashgabat International Airport project in Turkmenistan. Uh, and the site investigation shows the following stratification. As you can see here, uh, it's mostly uh, silty sand with some clay layers at depths of 5 and 12 meters depth. Uh, so existing soil uh, consists of mostly loose silty sand with thin clay layers. Uh, because of the cohesion structure of the existing uh, soil and high groundwater level, liquefaction risk at the site was very high. Uh, therefore, uh, a soil uh, improvement scheme was necessary for the main buildings like the terminal building, the cargo terminal, etc. Uh, 
the configuration of the test areas, uh, it was decided that experimental study uh, needed to be carried out based on details provided by the alternative designs for the same site using jet grout and stone columns. Two test areas were established next to each other in the same location and in situ and laboratory tests for both test areas were conducted. Both test areas uh, had a dimension of seven meter by seven meter and each had uh, 25 columns uh, with spacings of 1.8 uh, meter distance from each other. Uh, jet crowd columns with 16 meter lengths and 0.6 meter diameter and stone columns uh, with the same length and 0.8 meter diameter were designed to mitigate uh, the liquefaction risk. Uh, the liquefaction risk was investigated using in situ tests such as cone penetration testing, standard penetration testing, and also seismic wave velocity measurements. Also laboratory tests, including direct shear tests, density and void ratio measurements on undisturbed samples obtained from the soil uh, between the produce columns were conducted. All these institute tests and laboratory tests were of course conducted from the soil that remains in between uh, the columns. Uh, also seismic tests were conducted uh, to determine the shear wave velocity. Uh, so here you see the plan of jet crowd test area. As you can see, uh, in between columns, we conducted CPT or SPT or uh, uh, tests before and after. Uh, typically, as you can, uh, as you may know, uh, when you construct the jet crowd column, uh, it is not uh, guaranteed that you achieve the uh, perfect uh, shape and diameter. So uh, we did some excavation to see that the jet grout columns were uh, nicely formed. Uh, this is uh, the plan for stone column test area. Again, uh, in between the columns, we have uh, several CPT, SPT tests, etc. And here you see the uh, installed stone columns from the uh, top of the soil. When we look to the SPT results, you can see here uh, in green the SPT results before uh, installation of the jet crowds and in red after the installation. Uh, there was not a very significant change. Uh, it was only a plus or minus uh, one uh, maybe n number. Uh, so it uh, the results showed that there was no significant uh, improvement uh, in the soil in between uh, the columns. Uh, where uh, for the stone column area, if you look to the uh, uh, the blue line is the uh, SPT numbers before the test and the red and green lines are the ones after. At two locations, you don't see a difference at at this depth and uh, at this depth here at 12 meters. And these were uh, the uh, areas where we had clay, as I indicated before uh, in the uh, certification. And also CPT results uh, showed an increase of uh, comb penetration resistance in the uh, silt to sand layers. Uh, when we look to the laboratory tests, there was a significant uh, decrease in the void ratio uh, for the stone column. Before the improvement, the void ratio of the soil in between the columns were 0.59. It reduced to 0.54 and the friction angle significantly uh, increased. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also conducted uh, shear wave velocity measurements and it was determined that uh, after applying uh, stone columns, uh, the shear wave velocity of the soil increased from 170.4 meters per second before improvement to 250.7 meters after improvement, which indicates a 47% increase. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, 
post-treatment tests results shown uh, show an increase in the density of the soil between stone columns. This is because the soil consists mainly of silty sand and is therefore affected by the vibration of the probe during stone column installation. This increase in soil density leads to reduction of liquefaction risk. This uh, verified that stone columns provide a very efficient soil improvement in granular soils, as it is cited in the literature as well. Uh, another indication of the increased density was the significant increase in shear wave velocity by the use of stone column technique. Similarly, the increase in shear wave velocity is an indication of a decrease in the risk of liquefaction hazard. Uh, in case of jet grout columns, it was observed at least uh, at this uh, site and for this soil uh, that the soil in between columns uh, were not uh, significantly affected by the jet grout columns, so uh, the liquefaction risk uh, remained. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, uh, the acknowledge that this study was done within the scope of Ashgabat International Airport construction, and we would like to thank uh, both the contractor, Polymex Construction and Contracting Company, and uh, the engineering company ELC Royal Haskonen PHV for providing uh, the opportunity to conduct these tests. With this, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Güler, for your interesting presentation. Uh, I will move on to the next presentation. Uh, no the question, title. There is no I think there is no question, but is there any question? Do we have any questions about the presentations? I, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, then I will move on uh, with a video presentation submitted by Patrick Dobiski. Uh, the title of the presentation is Resilient Modulus as a Technical Parameter for Evaluating the Cement Stabilized Soil. My name is Piotr Kowalczyk. I'm an independent researcher, formerly staying at the University of Trento in Italy. And today I would like to present you my work entitled uh, Proposal of a Model Setup for Verification of the Origin of High Frequency Motion in Soil. The outline of my presentation contains, firstly, background to high frequency motion observed in soil. Secondly, I will introduce you very briefly to the general idea of uh, soil unloading elastic waves in the steady state solution. Uh, nextly, I will uh, show you the actual contribution uh, to this conference, which is a proposal of a, num of a perfect model setup analyzed numerically. And then I will conclude with a uh, sort of short summary. So let's begin. To start off, uh, let me introduce you to the typical observations in experimental works. Uh, very often, uh, even though the intended input motion at base of uh, soil specimen is perfectly sinusoidal, the response contains some unexpected high-frequency components. And explanations to the presence of such high-frequency components uh, included, for example, um, soil fluidization in dry soil or cyclic mobility in uh, saturated soil or even uh, pounding between soil and structural elements. Uh, moreover, experimental imperfections uh, can also be the source of such high frequencies. Let's move on to the introduction of the general idea of existence of uh, soil elastic unloading waves in the steady state response. So the general idea is that as we uh, shake our soil at base with a, a sinusoidal input motion, we do expect that, okay, there might be some amplification in the motion. However, we would in general expect that the, uh, the computed or the observed frequency at the top of the uh, soil is actually containing only uh, the input uh, frequency. This apparently does not always happen and um, often there is a the actual response contains uh, two, not, uh, two frequencies uh, being uh, present at the top of the soil, that being uh, uh, the natural frequency of soil 
in addition to the input frequency. So we could say that the solution in the steady state response is actually a function of the input frequency and the soil natural frequencies, which is then somehow similar to the traditional transient response in, uh, in dynamics. And this is new explanation to high frequency motion observed in soil. It is based on my previous works, firstly on my PhD thesis on general propagation of unloading waves, secondly on my works showing initial consideration and proofs of the potential existence of elastic waves in the steady state solution of a hysteretic soil. Uh, for example, numerical reproduction of the experimental results obtained by DAR can be shown here as uh, a promising proof now looking at the at a different example uh, in this case of a structural response uh, which is apparently affected by uh, unloading elastic waves uh, and for the, this purpose uh, if we look at the system analyzed on the left hand side with five files and a structure placed on uh, three of them we can observe that both computed and measured uh, accelerations show high frequency motion representative of uh, soil elastic waves um, however in this case, uh, we must say that the experimental setup contains uh, small, has been done in a small uh, soil container. To there is a chance that uh, boundary conditions affected the response. The soil profile is not really homogeneous, and there are also numerous structural elements embedded in soil. So there is a, a potential source of uh, additional waves uh, being generated in within this complex system. Therefore, uh, my work uh, on this conference uh, is a sort of a proposal of a perfect uh, experimental model setup investigated numerically. So I'll show you now methodology and results uh, of this short numerical study. Moving on to the methodology of uh, the numerical investigation of an imaginary perfect experimental model setup, it is assumed that uh, the flexible soil container is uh, relatively large. For example, it could be 5 meter long and 1 meter high. The input motion is uh, perfectly sinusoidal of a single harmonic of 5 hertz. And the soil is assumed dry, for example, late on buzzard sand uh, fraction E. And a simple structure or oscillator of uh, the natural frequency coincident with the so first soil natural frequency in this case, around 25 hertz is assumed to be placed at the top of the soil. The numerical study is a simple 2D finite element model containing soil and a structure sitting on, on its top. Uh, the input motion is a perfect uh, sinusoidal input motion of a frequency of 5 hertz. A uh, hypoplastic sand model is used uh, uh, to model soil nonlinearity in a reliable manner, and the model uh, parameters uh, are as shown in the in the presented table. Let's move on to the results. Uh, first of all, if we look at horizontal accelerations, uh, firstly in free field, so far away from uh, the structure, we can observe that high frequency motion of a repetitive uh, pattern in consecutive sine cycles. Uh, can be observed. Similarly, if we look at the response uh, computed on at the top of the oscillator, we can see again that there is a, a repetitive high frequency motion uh, uh, recorded, computed in uh, consecutive sine cycles. If we look at the spectral response of horizontal uh, accelerations, we can see that for free field and uh, for uh, the response computed on and the oscillator, there are some higher frequency components being present in the response. And most importantly, um, we can see increased the amount of uh, the frequency of 25 hertz, which is uh, representative of soil elastic waves. Uh, moreover, the um, high frequency motion does not appear only in uh, accelerations. It also appears in uh, uh, horizontal relative displacements, both in free field far away from the structure and on the top of the oscillator. This leads us to a short summary. I believe that uh, my 
short numerical study shows that soil elastic waves can apparently be observed in the steady state response of the soil and the structure, therefore uh, sort of confirming the possibility of the release of soil unloading elastic waves and need for uh, the actual experimental evaluation of the numerical findings appears evident uh, to me. Thank you for your attention. In case you have had some questions or a general interest in the topic or even a potential collaboration, uh, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, uh, I can also offer preprints of some of my other works on this topic. Um, these are available on request. Uh, I also can offer uh, example input files uh, using hypoplastic soil model. Uh, thank you again uh, for your attention. I thank uh, Mr. Patrick Dobriski for his uh, video presentation. And we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, it will be presented by Victor Ojotsa. The title of the presentation is Review of Improvement in Shear Strength for Fine Soils Succeeded by Waste Glass Utilization. Please go on. Could you please turn on your microphone? We cannot hear you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, can, could you please share your presentation with us? Oh, yes. Um, one minute, please. Uh, I have to remind you that we have only 10 minutes for presentation. Sorry, sorry about that. It's okay. Sorry, it's, it's uploading, it's just, yeah. Um, so good afternoon. Um, my name is Victor Jotisha. Um, my supervisor is Associate Prof. Dr. Aisha uh, Balkis. Today my topic will be on improvement of shear strength of fine grade soils by waste glass. Um, I'm happy and honored to be part of this uh, gathering for this conference in soil mechanics and geotechnics. Um, so I'll briefly, this is my table of contact. I'll briefly, I'll give a brief abstract introduction, soil types and some stabilization methods, the type of shear test we have, the aim of the um, paper, the test conducted, some results and conclusion and some recommendations for further um, analysis and my references. So um, foundation plays a very essential and important role in construction. Um, as we all know, as geotechnic engineers, Soil foundation is uh, is very important. It's crucial. Without foundation, structures can um, be built, and um, so we have to. Foundation is very important, and foundation we can't uh, work on foundation without dealing with soil. So, um, but soil has uh, a negative uh, engineering property, which is what uh, my paper is what is uh, about. A way to solve it, which is about um, soil stabilization. Soil stabilization is basically um, introducing a certain um, property or um, something to combat the negative aspect of the um, issue we are trying to solve. So this paper focuses on using waste glass. Um, I used uh, 0, 06, 8, 10, and 12 percent as a replacement of waste glass for the soil, and 10 percent was found to be my optimum. So, like I said, since the session of time, soil has always played a a very crucial role and it's very essential and some um, properties we look at when considering it is um shear strength lateral edge pressure consolidation bearing capacity of the soil the slope stability permeability and seepage amongst others um i'm focusing on the shear strength parameter part of it which is going to be cohesion and angle of internal friction um 
I did some brief explanations such as what consolidation is, which is whereby the volume of soil is compressed or it decreases as the load is being applied. Um, bearing capacity is the load is the um, load a soil can um, bear can sustain. Um, so the aim of this uh, study of, of this paper, as I said, is to um, combat the negative aspect of soil um, in terms of shear strength. So some of these soil types we have include peat soil, silt soil, sandy soil, clay soil, chalk soil, and loamy soil. Although I'll be focusing on clay soil. Um, so some of the stabilization techniques we have or methods include grouting, just like um, a fellow colleague just said two presentations ago. He talked about jet grouting. So grouting is one of the methods we can use. Also mixing of material, which is the method I'm going to be using for this paper, which is mixing of materials. Then we have the electrical stabilization, which is when uh, electromosis is, osmosis is used. So um, when we talk about waste, globally, waste is a uh, combat as well. We're trying to make um, the environment sustainable. We're trying to make sure things we use are um, environment friendly, eco-friendly. Eco so one of the methods we can use for this is by reusing waste. So if we reuse waste, we can reduce waste. Our landfills won't be mud, it won't be filled, and we won't have um, environmental pollution. So emissions from landfills are not really beneficial for the health, not just um, for the environment, not just environment, for us humans as well. So a way to um, solve this issue or dilemma is by reusing um, said waste. So um, I'll be using waste, which is waste glass, which is home. I have a picture which I'm going to show later on in my presentation. So some of the shear tests um, include triaxial shear tests, shear vein tests, torsion shear tests, and direct shear tests. For this paper, we only use direct shear test. It was only used. Um, like I said earlier on, the two parameters we'll be focusing on include cohesion and angle of internal friction. <clears throat> These two parameters are usually used in designing slopes and calculating the bearing strata and also to cal calculate consolidation parameters. So comparison for this paper will be made between these two parameters and we'll um, inter intertwine that with um, previous studies, the studies they've made and how does it how does it correlate with this study? So, like I said, on um, this is a waste glass. It's homemade waste glass from drinks. This was used. I used the same type. The same type of waste glass was used. Um, so, glass is an amorphous non-crystalline. Um, it's pozzolanic in nature. Just a brief um, explanation on it. Then this is when it has been um, grinded and broken down up to 0 0.300 micron passing sieve. This is 0 0.075, it's very fine. <clears throat> and this is um, the soil that was used. It is uh, lean clay soil. And it was also um, passing through 75 micron. So some of the tests con uh, conducted in the lab, This all these tests was done in the lab. Um, some of the tests con conducted included Atterberg limits, which is liquid limits, plastic limits, plasticity index. Then I did um, specific gravity was also conducted, water content, sieve analysis to know which type of soil. Then hydrometer test to know the percent of clay and silt in the soil. Then direct shear test, which is going to give us our equation and angle of internal friction. Um, so in discussion, um, performing construction over, over the soils, like I said earlier on, um, soil has weak engineering properties, which we are trying to uh, fix. We're trying to fix that dilemma. We're trying to substitute, make a substitution to take positive from two different um, things that have negative size and try to make it positive to give us a more beneficial usage. So um, one of the methods that has been used over, over the years is stabilization, which was what was used. And um, just like some studies found 10% to be optimum, I'm going to show some graph just after this. 10% was also my optimum for the waste glass to be used as a replacement. Otherwise, it turns to a negative, which is what we're trying to combat, we're trying to negate. So um, some also other studies as well found them to be the optimum. So you can use, um, so 10% was uh, the optimum. For example, this is my cohesion value for 300 micron. And as you can see, for zero, because I did 0%, uh, just soil only, then 6%, uh, 8%, 10%, and 12%. So 10% was found to be the optimum. After that, there's a down uh, slope, which was negative. For angle of internal friction, another thing I can attribute my angle of internal friction being negative while cohesion at the positive was it could be due to the shear box. Some literature review, some literature um, spoke about shear box being a factor for this. So, um, for example, I use the circular shear box. 
So if a rectangular shear box was used, it could it will give us an inverse result. Um, so this uh, a, a combined graph that showed the cohesion values for 0 0.75 micron and 300 micron. As you can see, 10% show, 10% uh, both show optimum for both. This is for angle of internal friction, still negative. Like I said, this can be attributed to the shear box. Um, in conclusion, for both sample, cohesion showed positive or for 10%, but after 10% it showed a negative um, result. Angle of internal friction can be uh, related to the type of shear box that was used. So um, other literature as well show 10% to be the optimum. So another thing we can do is for further studies, we can work with two different types of shear box boxes and compare the results, then work with um, a different type of soil as well, because it was also found out that for black cotton soil, 8% was optimum. So this um, certain factors can affect or have an impact mm. on it, which could be the type of soil or the type of shear box used and the type of waste glass used as well. So if other um, study can be done by using different types of waste glass to see if there's a chemical reaction included with it. And these are my references. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Any questions to the presenter? If Thank there you. are any questions. OK, there is no question. Uh, thank you, Victor, for your presentation, thank and you I thank much. you for contributing to a greener world uh, by providing much. friendly solutions to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Uh, so I will move on with the next presenter. Next presenter is my master student, uh, Mr. Ismail Tash. Uh, he will present a part of his uh, master's study. The title of his presentation is effect of free stove cycles on strength of a nanosilica and lime treated clay. Ismail, you can go on. You can turn on your microphone and go on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, dear audience. Sorry. Uh, my name is Ismail Tash. I'm a master of science student in Ege University. The title of my study that effect of free stoke cycles on the strength of a nanosilica lime and lime treated clay. The environmental conditions have an impact on the variation of the soil properties. Freezing of the ground uh, is a seasonal phenomenon that can be encountered frequently in many parts of the world. Free store effects, especially on soils with uh, expansive clay content, frequently cause great damage uh, and cost to the structures. As a result of free stove effects, volume change and loss of strength can be seen in the soil. As you can see in the picture, uh, free stove effects, uh, freezing of the water in the ground causes expansion, while towing causes a, a decrease in its volume. Various additives have been used throughout the, uh, throughout the engineering history to stabilize the soils. Uh, some of the commonly used uh, additives are cement and lime. But type of additives that cannot uh, that can provide environmentally friendly solutions are limited. Nanosized materials have been an important research topic in recent years. Nanosilica additive is in the green binder category and is a new uh, material. Uh, the kaolin clay was classified as a high plasticity silty soil MH according to ESTM standards. Also, uh, the liquid limit uh, of the soil was 52 and plastic limit was 34%. The optimum water content of the soil was uh, 32%. Quick lime was preferred as a stabilizing agent and nanosilica particles were 15 nanometers in a size uh, and have a purity of 99.5%. Uh, the specimens had a diameter 50 millimeter and length of uh, 100 millimeters. The temperature for the curing uh, was uh, 23 is degrees Celsius. Uh, freezing and towing temperature were approximately minus 18 and plus 18 degrees Celsius, respectively. The time for the each freezing and towing uh, action was 12 hours, and so uh, one cycle was completed in uh, tw uh, 24 hours. The strength of the spasms were determined uh, by unconfined compressive strength tests. The nanosilica 
uh, sorry, the lime content of the study was uh, five percent by the dry weight of the soil, and it's kept constant during the study. The nanosilica content uh, used in the study were 0.3, 0.5, 0.7, and one percent. Uh, firstly, uh, the dry soil were uh, dry soil and lime uh, were mixed. Then nanosilica was dissolved in the water, and uh, with a high speed uh, mixer and uh, added to dry uh, mixture. The water content of the specimens were adjusted to their uh, optimum water contents. Uh, you can see in the detail on the table. Uh, I would like to explain the effect uh, different materials and curing periods. Uh, with the addition of 5% lime to the soil, uh, the maximum dry root weight decreased and optimum water content of the uh, treated soil increased. Uh, Optimum water content of the soil and lime uh, added clay soils were 32% and 38%. And their uh, maximum dry densities were 1.60 and 1.50 gram per uh, centimeters, cubic centimeters, respectively. And uh, the clay soil had a strength of 205 kilopascal. And uh, after five and ten freestyle cycles, uh, the strength of the uh, clay decreased to 192 and uh, 160 kPa, uh, respectively. Uh, the strength of the five percent lime treated clay was uh, 311 uh, uh, kilopascals after seven days, and it increased to 408 uh, kilopascals after 28 days. So we can say uh, the strength of a five percent lime treated clay and was increased end of the seven and twenty days. In Figure four, uh, you can see uh, the change in the appearance uh, of the specimens between uh, zero and five freestyle cycles. Deterioration and minor cracks became visible. Uh, in Figure five, it is seen that the behavior of the clay uh, has changed from ductile to brittle behavior. Uh, with the addition action uh, of uh, freestyle. In order to examine uh, the individual effect of nanosilica on the strain, the specimens containing different amount of nanosilica were prepared. The gradual uh, increase of the strain was visible amount 0.3, 0.5, and 0.7 percent. Nanosilica uh, percent nanosilica traded specimens. Uh, however, there was a strength decrement in 1% nanosilica traded specimens. Uh, the excessive rate of nanosilica had a strength reduction, reducing uh, effect rather than contributing to it. Uh, so, there, uh, therefore, uh, the optimum nanosilica content was 0.7% in clay specimens. Uh, the effect of five and ten freestyle cycles were investigated on the nanosilica uh, traded specimens. The strength loss of the specimens is calculated with the formula uh, shown on slide. Uh, strength, strength loss of 0.7% nanosilica traded specimens was 16%, and uh, while the strength loss of 1% nanosilica traded specimens was 41%. Uh, although trace amount of nanosilica were used in the study, 0.5 and 0.7 percent nanosilica traced specimens kept the majority of uh, their against the uh, free store cycles. Uh, the last one, uh, the improvement to be achieved with the combined use of nanosilica and lime was investigated. Uh, according to the result of the unconfined compressive strength test, the 28 day strength of the specimens with 0.7% uh, nanosilica and 5% lime traded was 581 kilopascal, and it was the highest amount, uh, highest strength amount to the experimental groups. Uh, the 28 day strength of the uh, same traded specimen uh, was 1.25 times higher than uh, seven day strength. An evaluation of the uh, strength decrement of seven days, 0.7% nanosilica and 5% lime traded specimens show that at the end of five years of cycles, the strength of the specimens was 409 kilopascal. 
After 10 freeze-thaw cycles, the strength of the specimens decreased to 373 kilopascals. Uh, it's known that lime causes long-term reactions in the soil. However, adding the nanosilica has an accelerating effect on the ongoing reactions, reactions on the soil. The, the formation of the viscose gel due to pres presence of uh, nanosilica increased the durability of the specimens. Uh, when they were subject to free store cycles. So the effect of nanosilica and lime treatment of the unconfined compressive strength of clay uh, soil was assessed. The outcomes of the study is as follows. First one, uh, as a result of uh, the lime treatment on of the clay soil, the maximum dry unit weight uh, decreased and the uh, optimal moisture content of the soil increased. The unconfined compression strength decreased both in clay and lime treated uh, clay specimens after the application of free stall cycles. The addition of uh, nanosilica at different rate, rates from 0.3 to 1% on clay soil uh, showed some strength gain between 7 and 28 days. Uh, the highest strength was obtained with the addition of 0.7% uh, nanosilica. However, the strength of the solid lime uh, treated specimens were greater than the specimens that were uh, treated with solid nanosilica. Uh, the unconfined compressive strength of the specimens treated with the optimal amount of nanosilica and lime increased. Uh, so these results uh, were the highest strength obtained amount to other experimental groups. The strength of the specimens with 5% lime and 0.7% percent nanosilica group obtained after 10 free store cycles uh, was 373 kilopascals and this one being uh, 1.82 times more than the strength of the uh, untreated uh, clay. As a final point, this study shows that uh, soils can benefit from the usage, uh, usage of minor amounts of nanosilica additive to improve the ground conditions. Uh, thank you all for the listening. Well done, Ismail. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? I guess not. Okay. So I will uh, move to the next presentation. The presenter is Juan Wei Ko. He will present feasibility study of transforming excavated clayey soil into sand-like material. Hey, hi. Hey, hi. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so my name is Ko Juan Wei. I'm representing, uh, representing National University of Singapore. Then uh, today my topic is the feasibility, feasibility study of transforming excavated clay soil into sand-like material. Okay, so this is my outline today. I will begin with uh, introductions, objective, and some materials and methods, and some good conclusion also. All right, some introductions. So basically, we have a lot of clay soil excavated from construction activity uh, annually from, uh, for example, basement excavations, tunneling project, right? And normally, this clay soil would recycle to be used as an infill material for those uh, land reclamation projects, as shown in the picture over here. The lorry is dumping the clay soil into the infill ground. And as the clay soil infill need to be treated, uh, for example, surcharge preloading, normally a few meters of sand bay layer would lay on top of this clay uh, infill to support the weight of the PVD rig as shown in the picture over here. Okay. However, in our regions, we uh, actually have this sand shortage issue. So uh yeah so that's why given the ability uh, availability of the abundant excavated clay soil and lake of sand so we propose a feasibility study of transforming this excavated clay soil into kind of sand-like material so to transform this sand-like material we can actually employ sintering technology right and we actually propose i mean aim to use this sand-like material to partially replace the sand needed to form the bearing layer that I mentioned just now. 
Okay, so sintering is actually a thermal treatment that can transform clay into a solid and coherent product. Some of this product example is like ceramic, brick, and lightweight aggregate. Okay, and this table over here showing the difference between our products and light material and lightweight aggregate. So the raw material used for our product is mainly excavated soil, whereas for lightweight aggregate, uh, they are actually selected clay. And we don't need a uh, bloating effect, but lightweight aggregate, I say, is lightweight, so you need some bloating agent to add into the raw material. And as for the sintering temperature for our product, we uh, actually use uh, below 900 degrees Celsius. And for lightweight aggregate, normally they will sinter above uh, 1000 degrees Celsius. And the size for our material is smaller, about 1 to 5 mm. Then for lightweight aggregate, it's bigger. Uh, similar to the density, our material is uh, larger and lightweight aggregate will be lower. And this slide showing the mineralogical change in the sintering process of clay. So normally clay have uh, many kaolinite okay, in the natural state. After we sinter it above 500 degrees Celsius, it will uh, uh, occur an uh, endothermic di uh, dihydrosylation process and it will transform into metakaolinite, where metakaolinite is a more stable and non-erosive uh, mineral. And when you heat up uh, even further to 1000 or even 1200 degrees C, you, you will transfer, uh, transform into mulite, uh, which is very hard and sometimes can be brittle. But for our product, we will mainly focus on transforming it to, into metakaolinite. Okay, so this is the material that we use for this study. Uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, soft clay soil where you have uh, quite a large amount of seal and clay and the plastic limit is about uh, 75 to 80. Uh, liquid mix is 75 to 80 and plastic limit is about 40. And this is the process on how we um, uh, uh, manufacture our, our clay uh, sunlight material. First uh, is a raw clay and we will use a special uh, extruder to extrude it into trade uh, like and chop it into uh, about 3 mm in diameter. And this is the uh, tabletop muffle furnace that we use it to sinter. Uh, and this is the sintering schedule that we use in this study. Actually, we conducted uh, four different series where uh, uh, each of the sintering temperature and also the dueling durations are different. SLM1 and SLM2 will sinter, uh, was, was sinter in uh, 900 degrees C and the dueling duration was one hour and half an hour. Whereas for SLM3 and 4, uh, a slightly lower sinter temperature was used, uh, about 500 degrees C and the dueling duration was uh, two hour for SLM3 and one hour for SLM4, uh, right? And this is the end product of uh, our sintered metal. We call it cyan light material. Okay, so first uh, to characterize the cyan light material, we uh, first thing we will observe uh, what is the sintered percentage. So how to observe it or calculate it is that we chop off the intact pellet into half and roughly, roughly calculate what is the sintered uh, area. As shown in the uh, figure C over here, this is not fully sintered material where you can see a slightly darker color at the center, uh, representing uh, the natural state of the clay. Yep. And for this series of tests, we discovered that SLM1 with 900 degrees C of sintering temperature and one hour of dueling duration, we will have 100% of sinter area. So uh, for the rest of the test, we will uh, produce more of SLM1 sinter uh, product and, and go for uh, a series of other uh, tests. Okay, the first thing, uh, first test was the uh, individual particles uh, compression test. 
Again, this tape, uh, this graph over here showing the uh, mean composite strength of the metric itself. So as you can see, SLN1 with 100% of synthetic uh, percentage will produce a higher uh, co mean composite strength as compared to the others. And the value is actually comparable to bricks material. Yeah. And these are the physical properties of SLM1. Okay, the first uh, value over here is showing the most uh, loosely packed dry sanctity. Uh, is about uh, 1,200 kg per meter cube. Actually, it can be considered as a lightweight also, although we are not uh, intend to produce it into lightweight. And the effective friction angle, we are using a consolidated drain tractor cell. And the value of the friction angle is about 35 degree. And it's actually uh, comparable to a medium dense sense, which is what we want. And the permeability is about a, in the degree of uh, order of 10 power of negative 3 meter per second. Yeah, and it's actually comparable to gravel sense mixture. Yeah, so this both uh, value is uh, very preferable to us because of high friction angle, obviously, we will form a stable uh, bank layer and high permeability of this uh, sand, uh, bank layer will allow a rapid drainage uh, if we load uh, uh, with the surcharge. Yeah, so it will not, also it will not induce excess pore pressure. Yeah. Uh, next one, this is the, the compaction characteristic of the SLM1, where we using a modified portal to, to conduct a test. And this is the graph showing the maximum dry unit weight and the optimum moisture content. And comparing this value is actually comparable to the uh, my, uh, diamond meshes and mica silt. Although uh, this value is slightly lighter than the typical uh, sands and gravel, but from this graph is showing that, yes, our SLM1 sand light material is comparable and can be used to support uh, the whatever load loaded on top of this bank layer. And next, uh, we, we also conducted some mineralogy and soil fabric tests on this SLM1. Okay, first picture over here showing the X-ray deflections of our product. The red color line showing the raw material and the blue color line showing the synthet SLM1, okay? As you can see, the raw material have slightly more K. K represents uh, represent the kaolinite minerals. And after synthet in uh, about one hour of, uh, in 900 degrees C, you can see the, the K over here uh, was disappeared, okay? This proof that some of the kaolinite in the clay already transformed into meta -kali. Yep. And this diagram uh, showing the scanning electrode microscope of our, of our product. And all this uh, red colored uh, square actually represent the meta that's formed in our product. So both uh, uh, tests showing that we successfully transformed the kaolinite into metacaolin. And the last test would be the acid and salt water dissolubility. Okay, so as, as I mentioned before, the sunlight material will be used in land reclamation works. So it will likely to be exposed uh, in uh, seawater condition or even carbonic acid, acidic condition. So uh, normally carbonic acid would form when carbon dioxide in the air react with water. So I think uh, this is actually applicable to, to us, uh, especially in land reclamation work. So it's very crucial that we, we need to ensure that our product will not dissolve in both conditions. Yeah, so this four picture over here showing the real um, conditions when we soak our product into this acidic condition and salt, uh, salt water conditions. Uh, yeah. So left hand side is the day zero, and after twenty eight day, the, the the the I mean the color of the um, 
the solutions is very clear and there's no um, muddy kind of condition. So is so from this observation, we can say that our our our our product is not dissolved at all. Of course, we also try to weight the sample before and after we soak, and the difference in percentage is very small. In acidic condition, it's about one percent of difference in in in weight, and whereas for salt conditions, it's only zero point six. Yeah. So by showing uh, this, Mr. Ko, Mr. Ko, you are in the thirteenth minute. Uh, could you briefly sum up your presentation, uh, yeah. please? Sure. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. From all these tests, we can conclude that uh, we, we it is feasible to produce sunlight material from uh, this excavated clay soil, and we can use this uh, sunlight material to replace the uh, surface sand bank layer required during the ground treatment works in those uh, landing reclamation project. Uh, yeah, and this is the summary of the result. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, are Thank there you. any questions? Do we have any questions? There, there is no question. Okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, and I'll go on with the last presenter of this session. Uh, it's Muhammad Najamuddin. Uh, the title of the presentation is Estimation of Modular Ratio and Modulus of Deformation of Granular Piles from In-Stew Compression Tests Under Direct Loading. You may begin. Good evening, Professor. Hope I'm audible to you. Good evening, everyone uh, from Hyderabad, India. It's almost ma past 9 p.m. here. And uh, as we are already dragging behind, I will not take much of your time and wrap it up as soon as possible. I'm Mohammed Ajabuddin, uh, pursuing my master's in geotechnical engineering from the Department of Civil Engineering, Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, Hyderabad. Today, I'm going to present a uh, part of my master's thesis uh, regarding the estimation of modular ratio and modulus of deformation of granular piles from in situ compression test and a direct loading. So to begin with, I'll be discussing the introduction and the methodologies involved, followed by the case studies which we worked on and the results, and followed by the conclusion. Uh, as, uh, uh, as you all know, granular piles or, or stone columns, as we call them, uh, they are generally used for as an efficient ground improvement measure. Uh, in the Earlier in the session, Professor Gueller was also discussing regarding the same. and uh, uh, the granular piles or uh, stone columns can be used to improve the bearing capacity and reduce the settlements uh, of the soft soil. And uh, to the implementation implementation of these theoretical solutions to practical problems requires proper understanding of the shear and deformation parameters uh, of the uh, you know, reinforced ground. For which uh, Polos and Davis uh, uh, stated that uh, the deformation parameters can be Mm, estimated from laboratory triaxial results or in situ load tests or based on previous experiences using correlations. Due to the uncertainties involved in lab laboratory triaxial tests, uh, uh, in situ load tests can be a better, uh, better attempt in, in determining the uh, deformation parameters. Uh, for a quick uh, look back into the literature uh, regarding the settlement analysis, Madison Polos in 1969 employed the linear elastic theory, um, employed the linear elastic theory. Uh, to determine the settlement of a compressible pile uh, of circular cro uh, cross section in an ideal elastic soil mass. They presented the pile displacements in terms of dimensionless influence factors. Uh, for Madison Polos only considered the vertical displacements, whereas Sharma, uh, he, Sharma in his analysis, uh, they considered the vertical as well as radial displacements compatibility. And then Gupta and Sharma in 2018, uh, they also considered the non-homogeneity of granular piles uh, in the settlement uh, in an analyzing the settlement behavior of the stone columns 
Prasad and Madhav in 2006, they gave a parametric study to quantify the proportion of load transferred uh, onto, uh, through a granular bed onto a granular pile, uh, which uh, mainly depends on the stiffness of the uh, mainly depends on the relative sizes of the granular pile, granular bed involved and the diameter uh, and the sizes of the granular pile. Uh, it also depends on the stiffness, relative stiffness of the granular bed and the granular pile involved. Pathai et al. in 2012, they proposed a method uh, to determine the deformation parameters of uh, uh, granular pile uh, using numerical simulation. Yeah, they assume the deformation parameters and then uh, and, uh, set up a finite element modeling and analyze the results. Uh, after that, they compared it with the uh, in-situ load test results, and an iterative approach was used to determine the deformation parameters. In this present study, we have aimed to back-analyze uh, the deformation parameters using in-situ load test results by using the uh, by using dimension pa parameters given by Mattis and Polos. Uh, to begin with the methodology, uh, Mattis and Polos uh, uh, gave a settlement behavior regarding a compressible pile of uh, length L and diameter D. Uh, installed in a surround, uh, soil whose modulus of deformation is ES and, uh, and under pile, uh, axial load applied, the settlement behavior was given as uh, P by ES into L uh, into IP, where S is the settlement uh, occurred at the top of the pile, P is the applied load, ES is the modulus of deformation of the soil, and L is the length of the granular pile or stone column. And IP is the settlement influence factor. This settlement influence factor was given by Polos and Mattis uh, as a uh, which depends on the L by D ratio and the modular ratio of the granular pile. Uh, then to determine the uh, modulus of deformation of uh, uh, granular uh, of the soil, uh, we have uh, tried to rewrite the equation one in terms of ES, which comes to P into IP by S into L. Uh, and in from using this equation, you have to try to estimate the value of ES. In doing so, as we uh, can know the values of applied load and settlement from in situ compression load test on the granular pile, and then uh, we also know the length of the pile. So in this equation, we have two unknowns, which is ES and IP. Uh, so uh, we have tried to assume a modular ratio value from, uh, from 5 to 100. And using this, uh, we get the values of settlement influence factor. So to estimate ES, we have assumed the modular ratio, uh, and uh, we have calculated ES using this equation. Also, uh, Polos and uh, Madison Polos gave the settlement influence factors varying from 10 to 100. Uh, we have also included the values for uh, k equal to 5, which we have uh, uh, tried to extrapolate using the given curves by Madison Polos. Uh, this, uh, this is general test setup for a granular pile load test, which involves a granular bed of diameter dB and a thickness hb, and uh, below a plate, rigid plate of diameter dp, and the uh, and that, uh, as discussed by Prasad and Madhav, the load applied on the granular pile uh, will be completely be transferred on the uh, load applied will be transferred through the granular bed onto the granular pile only when the size of the plate and the granular bed are equal. Uh, only in that case, the entire load will be transferred onto the pile. And then the, we have proposed a few steps, uh, which I'll quickly go through for you. And then uh, uh, the first step is to obtain the applied load and settlement from in situ load test results. This is a general load test graph from which we can get the uh, applied load and the corresponding settlement from an appropriate uh, linear region of the graph. And then from the settlement influence factors for a appropriate range of 5 to 100, uh, we can get the settlement influence factors. And then the next step is to calculate ES from the equation 2 as discussed earlier. Uh, we, uh, we know the uh, applied load settlement and IP from the first step. And then we can, uh, we also know the length of the pile, we can calculate the value of ES. Uh, in the first step, we have assumed the value of K varying from 5 to 100, uh, and then estimated ES. Uh, the next thing is to plot the uh, assumed modular ratio uh, versus the modulus of deformation estimated values. Uh, we get a curve uh, for, a, uh, we get a curve for the estimated ES for the values of five, K equal to 5 to 100. After that, uh, we have tried to get a range of uh, modulus of deformation of soil based on the type of soil present at the site. Uh, using this value, we have, uh, we have uh, using the type of soil present, we have uh, tried to get a range from the uh, available data of modulus of deformation of soil and plotted it on the same plot. After that, we try to determine uh, the K value from the same plot with uh, the K value corresponding to the ES range. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this curve is the 
uh, estimated ES values, and this range is the uh, the range of ES uh, with respect to the uh, type of soil present. So we are trying to uh, get the modular ratio back uh, through uh, corresponding to these values. Uh, uh, finally, we, are, we can determine the uh, modulus of deformation of granular pile as a product of uh, modular ratio and ES obtained from the step four and step five respectively. Uh, these are a few case studies which we have uh, uh, tried to validate uh, using the available uh, using from the available literature. Uh, Hock and Alamgir, uh, they performed a load test uh, on a granular pile of uh, 8.5 meter diameter, 8.5 meter length and 0.3 meter diameter, uh, which was installed in Khulna University campus in Bangladesh. Uh, they used a test plate uh, of 0.3 meter diameter and the test was uh, conducted on the natural soil as well as on the granular pile after one month of its installation and on uh, after one year of the installation uh, the soil profile listed layers of silty sand clay silt and organic clay as you can see here so we have uh, used this road settlement plot given and tried to estimate the es values and corresponding modular ratios uh, these are the results for the first case study uh, uh, as you can see here the range Estimated ES values uh, for assumed K of 5 to 100 for a range uh, for undrained and drained conditions. Here, uh, as, we, as we know that uh, the test was conducted for one month and uh, one year after the installation of the granular pile, we can relate this, relate these conditions to uh, uh, undrained and relatively drained conditions of the granular pile, since we have tried to name it here. So for the corresponding ES values are for a K, assumed K of 5 to 100, we get a 8 to 3.8 megapascal and 6.1 to 2.9 megapascal. Uh, following uh, after that, uh, from this from the plotted graph, the, uh, this is the range of ES based on the type of soil present. Uh, we have tried to uh, take a weighted average for uh, uh, stratified layers of soil by giving weightage to higher layers along the length of the pile. So from this, uh, as uh, we can see here, uh, the ES range is 8 to 4, four for an ES range of 8 to 4.4. Uh, we get a, a modular ratio of 5 to 64 for the untrained condition and for the drained conditions for a, a ES range of 6 to uh, 4, 4.4, we get a modular ratios of 5 to 28. Uh, now going, moving on to the next one, uh, Vosley and Vaisham Payan, they uh, installed a uh, granular piles and connected load test on the uh, to improve the soil conditions on container yard in Vallapartham Island, Cochin, India. The granular piles used were 20 meter in length and 0.9 meter in diameter. Uh, the test plate size was 0 0.0 meter diameter and below it, it there was a sand blanket of 100 mm thickness. Uh, due to the equal diameter of the plate and the granular pile and uh, the entire load was assumed to be transfer uh, onto the granular pile. The soil profile listed layers of silty sand, soft clay and fine sand. And this is the load settlement response gear, uh, result of the in situ load test. The results uh, uh, you can see here. Uh, this is the estimated ES for a range of 5 to 100, which ranges from 7.9 to 8.3 megapascal. And this is the range of uh, ES based on type of soil present, which ranges from 7.5 to 14. And the corresponding values which we get for the modular ratio are for, for 14 to 8.3, we get uh, around 22 to 100 uh, modular ratio. And similarly, we can calculate the deformation, deformation modulus of granular pile as a product of ES and K. Uh, now this is the last case, uh, which was done by Mokhtari and Karantari. Uh, they conducted load test at a site. Uh, they conducted four tests on the north, south, west, and east of the site, entire site. And they used the granular piles of length 12 meters and 0.8 meter diameter. Uh, the test plate size was 0 0.6 meter diameter and the soil profile was uh, consisted of silt, uh, silt layers mostly. Uh, this is the load settlement response of all the four uh, load tests conducted. Uh, here we have estimated the ES values for all the cases and plotted in this graph. And the, this is the ES range based on the type of soil present for, for the silt condition and the corresponding for the south case for the corresponding modular ratios which we get is 5 to 31. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, as we can see that the ES values obtained are quite uh, less than the uh, ES range of the so type of soil present. Uh, this might be due to the fact that the uh, diameter of the plate used is lesser than the diameter of the granular pile involved. And uh, due to this, uh, when the, on the application of load, there might be squeezing out of particles at the top of the uh, granular pile, which increases the diameter. Uh, 
due to the increase in diameter there might be a decrease which this affects the settlement influence factors and there may be uh, this, and there may be a decrease in the es values if the if there is if there is no increase in diameter at the top of the pie then the settlement influence factors tend to be higher and es will also be uh, higher to conclude i would like to add that uh, efficient ground improvement using granular piles require understanding of its uh, settlement behavior this settlement prediction uh, depends on the deformation parameters of the ground and granular pile uh, uh, in this proposed study uh, we tried we tried to estimate the deformation parameters using a simple back analysis approach uh, which which reflects the, the, the these deformance parameters uh, re reflect the actual in situ behavior the the design of the granular piles can be enhanced using the deformation parameter actual in situ deformation parameter values and uh, we valid, validated these this uh, Met proposed method using different case studies, and it indicated that these deformation parameters help. Uh, uh, indicated that we can use the in-situ load test to back, an back analyze the deformation parameters, which helps in predicting the settlement uh, of the granular piles. These are a few references which I had gone through. Thank you. I would like to thank Professor Madhav and Professor Padma Padmaavati for their contribution. Uh, in in my study, and also I'd like to thank Professor uh, organizers Professor Fraser and Professor Javit and their entire team for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, we don't have any questions. I would like to thank to all the listeners, all the presenters of this session, especially the presenters for their nice presentations. Uh, here we come to the end of this session. Uh, right after this session, um, I would like to invite Professor Feyza Çinicioğlu and Professor Javid Atalar, the organizing committee chairs of this conference for the closing ceremony. Hayatımızda hiç eğer olmasaydı nasıl olur? Size şöyle söyleyeyim. Her şey daha az parlak, daha az yeşil olur ve daha az parlak yeşil. Çünkü eğerler ormanların derinliklerinde tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşler. Eğerler Nobel ve Guggenheim'ın aklına takılır ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırar. Asla yalnız yürümez ve aşırı bulaşıcıdırlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler günü umursamazlar, robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıl dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. Yakın doğu. Kıbrıs'ın en köklü ve en büyük kurumu olan yakın doğu oluşumu bugün iştirakleri ve bünyesinde yaklaşık 7 bin personeliyle 
Eğitimde, sağlıkta, bilimde, teknolojide, elektrikli araç üretiminde, finans, sanayi ve turizmde faaliyetler yürütmekte, araştırma ve geliştirme merkezleriyle evrensel boyutlarda çağın ihtiyaçlarını geliştirmek ve üretmek vizyonuyla hareket ederek Kıbrıs halkına ve insanlığa hizmet vermektedir. Yakın doğu oluşumu bünyesinde Lefkoşa ve Girne'de iki tam donanımlı Aaflas Hastane, iki tam donanımlı Diş Hastanesi, bir Hayvan Hastanesi ve üç ilçede dispanserler bulunmaktadır. Yakın zamanda hizmet vermesi planlanan Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Yeni Boğaziçi Hastanesi'nin açılışıyla birlikte sağlık hizmetleri alanındaki yetkinliğimiz ülkemizin doğusuna da taşınarak Mausa ve İskele bölgesindeki tam donanımlı hastane ihtiyacını da gidermiş olacaktır. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Hastanesi ve Doktor Suat Günsel Girne Üniversitesi Hastanesi'nde sunulan sağlık hizmetlerinden öne çıkanlar ve teknolojik donanımların bazıları ise şöyle sıralanabilir. Kalp Nakil Merkezi Kardiyovasküler cerrahide minimal, invaziv, kesiyle kapak ve bypass ameliyatları. Tüm onkolojik ve laparoskopik cerrahiler. Kardiyolojik tüm girişimler ve uygulamalar. Tabi, mitraklip, kriyo, karto, pil, ICD, pankreas kanserlerine yönelik radyonüklit tedavi, karaciğer kanserine yönelik radyo mikroküre tedavisi, nükleer tıp görüntüleme ve uygulamaları, prostat kanserine yönelik PSMA, PEP, BT görüntüleme ve rutesyum 177 PSMA tedavisi. Sinir nöro monitorizasyon teknolojisi video EEG nöro monitorizasyon EMG terapotik hipotermi cihazı yeni doğan ve çocuk yoğun bakımı ileri teknoloji trifokal mercek uygulaması relax smile lazer kesisiz göz operasyonu vitrektomi ameliyatları kapalı ameliyatlarda kullanılan 3D görüntüleme teknolojisi kardiyak MR girişimsel radyoloji stroke merkezi 3 Tesla ve 1.5 Tesla MRI 614 kesit BT, Rapitark, Linak ve Biraki Terapi, Tüp Bebek Saç Ekim Merkezi, Obezite Cerrahisi, Ameliyatsız Şemsiye Yöntemiyle Kalp Deliği Kapatılması, Ameliyatsız Varis Tedavisi Yöntemleri. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi Hastanesi'nde yaklaşık 110 ve Doktor Suat Günsel Girne Üniversitesi Hastanesi'nde yaklaşık 40 seçkin hekim kadrosuyla adada kıtalı gibi yaşama ilkesi ve Kıbrıs Türk halkıyla bu coğrafyada yaşayanların sağlık konusunda dışa bağımlılığı ortadan kalkmıştır. Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi ID Scientific Index'in yayınladığı En İyi Üniversiteler Sıralaması 2022'de 488. sırada yer alarak dünyanın en iyi ilk 500 üniversitesi arasına girmiş ve Türkiye'mizde dahil ilk 500'de yer alan 4 Türk Üniversitesi'nden biri olmuştur. Yakın Doğu Oluşumu Kıbrıs Araba Müzesi, Kıbrıs Modern Sanat Müzesi, Günsel Elektrikli Araç Üretimi, Doktor Suat Günsel Girne Üniversitesi'nde verilen pilotluk eğitimi ve daha birçok alanda çalışmaları ile birlikte oluşturduğu vizyon ve üstlendiği misyon ile Kıbrıs Türk Halkı'nın ve Kuzey Kıbrıs Türk Cumhuriyeti'nin dünya üzerinde hak ettiği değerde ve yerde var olması için var gücüyle çalışmaya, üretmeye ve ilkleri yaşatmaya devam etmektedir. olmadı. Böyle yapalım. Feyza hocam. Efendim hocam. Evet. E, kayıttayız. E, siz mi başlarsınız ben mi başlarım ne diyorsunuz? İsterseniz siz başlayın hocam. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, 
I think for the United States, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, possibly for uh, West Europe or I'm not quite sure. Uh, and good evening, uh, good evening, Australia and uh, Far East. Uh, wherever you are, uh, we would like to thank everybody who contributed to the fifth international conference of uh, new developments uh, for soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering, which was organized by the nearest university and the Turkish Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. Uh, for the two days, we had a very, very busy conference. Uh, we would like to extend our uh, deeper thanks to the president of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, uh, His Excellency Ersin Tatar, the president of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, uh, Dr. Mark Baluz, and the president of the Turkish Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, Dr. Rasin Düzgür, and all the uh, our friends who helped us organize this conference and contributed. Uh, for the first time in on our fifth uh, try, uh, despite our uh, efforts to have this conference face to face, uh, we had to change it to online. But uh, I will tell you, uh, our expectation for online was uh, not so high, but the participation and contribution of the authors uh, is tremendous. For example, almost uh, six of our uh, uh, lectures uh, were uh, average 95 percent maybe. Some of them they couldn't come, they sent their videos. So this is why for local time 9.15 in Istanbul and Lefkosha, Nicosia, we have to uh, be with you. Uh, these conferences, it's an uh, organization uh, by two bodies, the nearest university and the Turkish Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. Actually, the conferences started by the initiation and suggestion of Professor Ergun Taurul. We, as the nearest university, our rector uh, sent uh, a letter to Professor Taurul and asked him to, in 2002, exactly 20 years ago, to hold the national uh, conference, which is being held every two years. And uh, uh, our rector, Professor Dr. Imit Hassan, uh, explained that we had a lot of experience about the International Water Conference, uh, International Earthquake Conference, and the other conferences. And then, Professor Turul suggested that we should uh, organize an international conference instead of a uh, national conference. So we started and we started uh, organizing it. We started in February and we organized it in May 
and we have a tremendous success. The Vice President of uh, ISSMG, Professor Dr. Petro Pinto, uh, opened the conference, the first conference in 2003. Then we held another conference in 2009. Then Professor Pinto was the president of the society. He attended as well. 2012, uh, uh, this is 2003, 2003, but I will go up here. And uh, these are the organizing committee chairs. Uh, pro, uh, 2003, 2009, 2012, 16, and 22. Uh, 2003, I was with Professor D Dr. Ergun Torul. Uh, Nine with Professor Dr. Ahmad Saglamer, and the last two with Professor Dr. Feiza Chirijiolu. And the ISSMG uh, uh, highest ranking persons were they were here. It was Professor Dr. Petro Pinto, as I said, and Professor Dr. Pinto uh, as a president, first as a vice president of Europe. Uh, Professor Jean Liu uh, Prea uh, in 2012, uh, Professor Dr. Anthony Jens on behalf of the president, Martin, in 2016, and this time online, uh, Dr. Mark Baluz. We are very thankful to them. This is our conference in 2003. This is our conference in 2009. 2012, 2016, and of course, 2020 is online. There are some pictures which we took during these times. Uh, you cannot see the pictures, Professor Atalar. Uh, you cannot see them. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so uh, no, yes. you can see them. Yes, yes. Okay, 2003, 2009, 2012. Of course, I'm telling the presidents, but for example, in 2012, here we have uh, at least three presidents here. Uh, uh, Professor Brio, Professor Pinto, and Professor uh, Charles, we are here with us. Uh, altogether here we have uh, five presidents uh, we are in our conferences and vice presidents. For example, here is Munir. Uh, we have African, European, Asian vice presidents all with us. And this one is uh, 2016. Again, and also Professor Das was with us for the uh, first uh, three, and they were competing with Professor Pinto, who was going to come to uh, more uh, times. This is African pre president, 2012. Uh, Ivan Vanijek, all conferences he, con he, he came, the first conferences, the four conferences, and this year as well, uh, online, he was with us. Uh, Professor Pinto, Professor Brio, uh, now the Korean president, uh, now is uh, the, is Professor Kim from Korea, which was the uh, chair of the conference in Korea 2017. And here we can see, here is uh, Charles, uh, the president in 2017, the immediate past presidents. As you can see, the presidents uh, here, uh, vice presidents, two vice presidents, the president, and then the immediate past president, uh, uh, Professor Das, uh, Professor Turul, 
e, Profesör Erkan Gürel, Erkan Gürel, e, Şin, e, Feyza Çinicioğlu, Profesör Çinicioğlu, and then the Korean President, e, now Profesör Asgar, to Profesör e, Turul, the Kazakh e, hat, e, and then again all together a picture with uh, uh, Professor Durgunoğlu, a lot of persons, uh, uh, vice president rector of the university, Professor Dr. Uh, Şenol Bektaş. And then not only work hard, but we enjoyed ourselves as well. Uh, and even uh, we gave some uh, uh, gifts, thanks to our uh, high ranking uh, uh, guest Tunjar Adil he mentioned uh, yesterday morning he was here yes with his family and my wife here and his wife and daughter and also for the same ceremony and then we were we got his historical places as you know this is near Bedestan this is the uh, Selimiye Jami which was for the 200 years or 400 years, the most important building in the Middle East, the same pictures. And then uh, uh, I think this is the end of the presentation. This conference would not have been possible by the help of our uh, founding pre president of the Anist University, Dr. Swat Günsel which the Honorable uh, Committee uh, Conference Chair of the conference and the uh, President of the Management Committee of the Nearest University, Professor Dr. Uh, Irfan Günsel. But of course, as I said, this conference is possible by the chairs and the president of, of the Turkish Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering and the uh, committee and the members. And we are thankful for all their uh, uh, help. And Professor Dr. Feyza Çinicioğlu, for the last three conferences, we are together. Therefore, uh, we had a, a very good team, like Professor Turul and Professor Sarlamer before, and we are keeping go going this conference. I hope in the future we will have uh, maybe face-to-face -face conferences, but whatever is the hard times which we have, we are working for the benefit of the humanity by we believe that we, by doing these conferences, we are giving a chance to the youngsters. And this conference, we got a, a, lo a, a lot of young scientists, young master students and PhD students, which we are working very hard and they are doing a very good job with their uh, professor, uh, distinguished professors, to have a better uh, uh, solutions and hopefully if, uh, not having to demolish any building uh, at all but because of the soil characteristics and withstanding the dynamic loads which are very much in these days and I would like to thank everybody for uh, uh, their distribution of this conference, uh, mainly to Professor uh, Feyza Çinicioğlu. Thank you all and thank you, Professor uh, Çinicioğlu. Thank you, Professor Atalar. Yes, we came to the end of two days, which were extremely beneficial for all of us as geotechnical people, all of us as researchers, practitioners, and students, we learned a lot. The success of a conference, in my opinion, 
is measured by its scientific and social value. As researchers, practitioners, and science students, we are always in need of uh, improving our knowledge, our understanding, and our vision. Conferences are condensed means of this need. By learning what our colleagues are researching and practicing, or by seeing what are the recent applications, our minds are reset and ignited with a new stream of ideas. These also open doors to new collaborations and interactions. If this conference is evaluated in this respect, I will say without hesitation that it gets the full marks in terms of its scientific value. This can easily be seen if you go through the program, starting with the keynote speakers and adding the invaluable contributions of the presenters. We were once more shaken by the extensive coverage of the geotechnical engineering. This is a subject in the core of advancement of civilization and the problems associated with it. During the conference, on the first day, we have started with the keynote lecture of Professor Suzanne Lacasse, for example. He gave such a comprehensive view of geotechnical problems and their uh, solution at the current state that uh, uh, and she built up uh, such a fra framework over a sound uh, scientific foundation that uh, once again, we saw the extensive coverage and ever, uh, ever getting increasing extent of our profession. Uh, she uh, built up her problem on a, uh, uh, on a, uh, on a uh, solution of a, a slope stability problem, but over a slope stability problem, uh, she has covered uh, and she has covered every aspect, including the human behaviors and political strategies and their uh, influences on the subject. And uh, by using all these influences, she uh, showed how to apply a most up-to-date uh, solutions like uh, machine learning, rem remote sensing, uh, artificial neural networks, risk assessment, and uh, all of the other possible approaches. Professor Fudun con uh, continued in the same direction, and Professor Edel to uh, Edith took us to a more a specific problem, its scientific solution and application in infrastructure projects. Professor Das, Professor Halit, Professor Munir Bosida, and Professor Shu, uh, Shin took us to the application side, which has also had close interactions with a huge industry. And also our uh, presenters of the papers covered many examples of these up-to-date topics all the recent considerations of climate impact, digitalization, energy geotechnics, and sustainability were covered during the presentations. And I would like to applaud all of them with heartfelt appreciation. And of course, the last but not the least, our uh, session chairs, they did really wonderful job. And uh, if we come to the social side, uh, of course, it could only be achieved up to this extent as an online conference. However, I rely on my co-chair in this respect uh, because he's a magician. He knows how to advance to every event. However, I think we have to ask for a promise from him for a face-to-face -face event uh, in the near future. I think 
uh, I should conclude now and once again uh, by, extend, uh, by extending my sincere appreciation to all of the contributors during the organization and real realization of the conference, I wish you well-being up to the next one when we see each other personally in a next conference, which will be held by Professor Atalar again, hopefully. Thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitations and thank you very much for your interest in our conference. Okay. Uh, no, leave us together. Leave us together, please. Leave us together. Uh, now, uh, uh, both of us will declare this conference closed now. Okay. Yes. One, two, three. This, this, okay. But yes. Together. This, this conference, conference is, is closed. Closed. <laughs> Eğer ki, eğer ki, hayatımızda hiç eğer olmasaydı nasıl olurdu? Size şöyle söyleyeyim, her şey daha az parlak, daha az yeşil olur ve daha az parlak yeşil. Çünkü eğerler ormanların derinliklerinde tek bir kibritle derinlerin kıvılcımını ateşler. Eğerler Nobel ve Guggenheim'ın aklına takılır ve o kodu bu kodu çözerler. Eğerlerle içinizden haykırmak gelir. Eğerler bariyerleri kırarlar. Asla yalnız yürümezler ve aşırı bulaşıcıdırlar. Eğerler aşikardır ve son anda golü atarlar. Eğerler dünü umursamazlar, robotlarla bile konuşabilirler. Karşı takım soluklanırken oynamaya durmadan devam ederler. Sadece basit bir kelime öyle mi? Hayır. Eğerler asla uyumazlar. Hep daha fazla çaba gösterirler. Eğerler bakar, araştırır ve en beklenmedik zamanda ortaya çıkarlar. Eğerler klonlanarak çoğalırlar. Acaba gerçekten yapabilir misin? Yaptın bile. Eğerler aklınıza girmeye çalışan güler yüzlü şakacılardır. Eğerler kapıları açarlar. Asla kaybetmeyeceklerini bilirler. Ve biraz gün ışığına her zaman hazırdırlar. Her şey bir eğerle başlar. Çünkü eğerler ne zaman dönüşür, ne zamanlarsa şimdi. Ve şimdi nasıla dönüşür? Nasılsa asıl. Eğerler bakış açınızı değiştirir. Eğerler oyunu değiştirir. Eğerler dünyayı değiştirir. Biliyoruz. Çünkü biz eğerlerle çalışıyoruz. <gülüyor>